as well. Um, thank you everybody for coming. Today we have uh, Danielle Scarlett with us, who is a, reg a registered recreation therapist. Uh, but before I completely introduce Danielle, we are gonna go through a few things about what we're doing here at Room 217. So our next uh, webinar is on May 8th, 2024. We will be having our webinar on Music Care Certify. At this webinar, you will be hearing stories on why you as an individual or an organization should become certified. I don't know if you've seen, but our next conference has been confirmed for November 23rd at Wilfrid Laurier University. We have confirmed uh, a few guest speakers. We will have Brian Harris, who is the co-founder and CEO of MedRhythms, Emily Folks, who's from the UK, and she's from the founder of Singing for Health Network. And our headliner this year will be Jackie Richardson, who is an award-winning actress and one of Canada's foremost singers of gospel, blues, and jazz. You can join us in person or virtually, and registration opens on May 15th. Uh, we have some great dates coming up for level one, two, and three. This is a great way for you to learn how to integrate music into your regular care practice with our standard music care training. Our next level one is uh, very quickly um, filling up, and that is May 15th and 16th, and it's virtually. Our certified community is growing. We did just uh, certify a new organization here on hospice. We will have their stuff up uh, soon and we're gonna be, we're planning their reg their celebration in May. Uh, so Music Care Certified, it recognizes, if you don't know, recognizes individuals and organizations for achieving outstanding music care delivery. So if you want to know more about how you can become certified or your organization, just give me a call or email at talbus at room217.ca. Now, oh, it decided it wanted to stop sharing. So I'm gonna hit stop share. Um, but as you all know, the reason that we are all here is for Danielle Scarlett. Danielle is a registered rec therapist in the Ottawa area that has 10 years of experience working with individuals of all ages and abilities. Over the last seven years, she has specialized in providing rec therapy support to children, youth, and young adults living with various disabilities, diagnosis, and challenges. Danielle completed her music care certification in 2017 and has used mu music care in all aspects of her career working with children and youth. Danielle is passionate about music and rec as a therapeutic intervention to help children, youth, and young adults reach their goals, express themselves, and live an optimal life. There you go, Danielle, all to you. Sorry, my computer's doing weird things. Hello, everybody. Thank you, Tanya, for that wonderful um, introduction. I swear sometimes I just do these because you get this like beautiful introduction of yourself and you're like, oh, thanks, everybody. <laughs> Um, so as Tanya had said, my name's Danielle and it's an honor to be with you here today. We are going to spend the next little bit talking about music care in both a community pediatric sense, but also in a pediatric hospice sense, actually, um, because I did spend most of my career working in pediatric hospice. So um, this is just a brief little, gives you a little idea of where we're going. I work with kids um, with varying abilities and disabilities, so I like to give people transition cues. <laughs> so this is everything we're going to kind of go through today. So we're going to talk a bit about who I am, besides what Tanya said. Um, I'm going to ask you guys to just jump in the chat in a bit and tell me a little bit about who you are and why this webinar interested you, what kind of populations you work with. We're going to get a bit into why children are so important. Um, and why we play with them, and music goes into this concept of play. We're obviously going to talk a bit about music care with children. I'm going to give you a brief idea of how to set up a music care program for children and how I did so working in pediatric hospice years ago, as well as I have some key takeaways for you guys, and there'll be a little bit of time for questions and, and discussion. So, who am I? 
Um, I have a Bachelor of Arts in Applied Human Science from Concordia University in Montreal. And I also have a minor in marketing. So I'm a little bit of a everything everywhere type of person. Uh, but I have been a registered recreation therapist for 10 years now. And I have worked not only with kids, but I started my career in long term care and working with adults with mental health challenges and slowly transitioned into kids ever so beautifully, um, starting my work in pediatric hospice, which was in 2015. Since 2015, um, I have explored different avenues and I actually went into private practice uh, last year in January of 2023 because I realized that rec therapy is so universal and I didn't want to just niche myself to hospice. There were so many other youth in the community that I wanted to be able to help live a high quality of life. So now I actually specialize in working with all types of kids. Um, the majority of my youth right now are youth who are involved in the justice system. So youth at risk, um, kids with fetal alcohol syndrome, ASD. Um, I also work with adults with TBIs, which is very random, but it's <laughs> it happened for me. So we went with it, um, as well as ODD, ADHD, and anxiety. So I'm kind of a one-stop shop for children and youth. And I did complete all three levels of my music care with room 217 back in 2018 was when I finished my level three. So when we talk a bit about how I created a music care program, that's where room 217 comes in so beautifully because I was mentored how to do that. And now they invite me back to teach you guys <laughs> how to do it. So just quickly, if you can open up your chat and just give me a sense of, do you work with kids? Are you just interested in working with kids? And where are you joining us from? What city? That would be fantastic. I'm in Ottawa, by the way, in my basement. <laughs> Welcome. Hi. Um, well, I'm a therapeutic harper with hospice and two hospitals. Okay. And one of the places I play is in uh, one of the hospitals in the childbirth center, which, of course, is, you know, so small i mean i can't i don't actually see the um families because behind closed doors but i still work with the staff and occasionally there are times when unfortunately if there's a fetal demise situation or something like that you know I'm, i can be there my main work with hospice um we rarely see children there but it will happen now and then and i was really interested in this because i thought okay maybe there'll be some value here for me that i can then take back to hospice and the other hospital I play throughout the major wards and there are occasionally children there as well. So Amazing. I've been doing this on a volunteer basis since 1998, off and on, and um, currently been very busy here. And I've worked with two uh, national organizations as well. So I wanted to very thank you again for bringing this on and looking forward to it. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you for sharing. And this is great, actually, because some of what we're going to talk about is in my grief work, um, I work with siblings a lot too. So this can kind of tie into what you do because it doesn't have to be a child with a disability. It can just be somebody that's passing by you that you can incorporate. So that's amazing. Good. We have people from Toronto, um, people transitioning to kids, people just interested in kids, um, which is beautiful because I transitioned from long-term care to kids. So that is wonderful. Thank you guys for sharing. So. Every presentation I ever give in my life, <laughs> it always comes back to why are play experiences, including music, so important for kids. So we engage with children in a playful way because play is how children express themselves. Play is how children learn. Play is how children figure out what's normal, what's not, who they vibe with, who they don't. Um, and it's really a language for kids. And this is where rec therapy and music hair partnered so beautifully for me is I was already playing. But then I created this skill set of, well, I can play with music and I can bring in this whole other concept that will just benefit the kids that I'm engaging with. So I always like to remind people who don't work with kids that play is the best way to get to know a child. And even if you're not working with kids, 
play allows adults, seniors to connect with that inner child that is so therapeutic and beneficial for us and that we forget to do all the time as adults. So Danielle, that's so great. But how do we use music to play with these kids? So there's many ways we can do that. We can use music to help kids express their emotions. We can help kids build community through music. We can teach them how to self-regulate their emotions. We can trigger their creativity and we can create connection. All of these things can come from one simple music care strategy that we're gonna talk about in a little bit. So when I say that we can help kids express their emotions, music can help kids identify feelings. So that emotional education side of things and express their emotions. So when I'm working with kids and we're working on emotional work, I might play a song and say, does this song make you feel happy or sad? Sad, oh, why? Maybe because the beat's really low, the tempo's slow. Um, maybe it's a song that triggers a sad memory in their head. And then we can talk about, well, how do you express sadness? Can you make a noise or a sound that expresses sadness? Kids often struggle to find the words to express these emotions. It's difficult for them to say, I am sad because... But if you start including sound and music, they no longer have to own those words. They can express things from a totally different entity. When we say connection, we all know that music is a common ground for humanity. We all connect through music. We are musical beings. The first things that we heard in our mother's womb was a heartbeat, right? We always connect back to sound. Music has a way to eliminate power, power struggles, because it is such a common ground. We can sit with people that we might not agree with or like and still listen to music together in peace. And music also creates vulnerability, which then in turn creates connection. And it's very difficult to be vulnerable with people. I remember doing my Room 217 level one and they asked me to share a song and I felt like I was giving a piece of my identity away and I didn't even realize it because I'd never thought of music in that capacity. So just by giving someone a song that I enjoy or a song that triggers a memory creates vulnerability and then other people in the group also create vulnerability because they're also sharing, which in turn creates a connection. Kids process their life through play. We had just mentioned that. So music also can help kids relate to their life situations. So doing a simple lyric analysis with a child where we're choosing a piece of music, we are providing them the lyrics and they get to circle or highlight the words that stand out to them and help them connect to what's going on in their life. So music creates a simplicity for people of how to connect with themselves and with others. Music's also fun. Who doesn't love getting an instrument and being silly? Um, who doesn't love listening to their favorite song and dancing around? Whether it's free or structured is irrelevant. It's still play and it's still enjoyable for a lot of people. And with music and different strategies that we're going to talk about, we can assist kids with regulating themselves because music is a form of coping. I cope entirely <laughs> with music. I am like the guru of energy matching for music. If you were in my car any given day, you would know exactly how I felt based on what music I was playing, right? And if I'm really sad and I'm about to go hang out with a kid and I can't be sad, you'll see me change the music to try and change my, my mood. So we as adults use music and so do kids. I always say to parents, if you have a teenager, because teenagers scare people <laughs> a lot of the time, what music they're playing in their room will tell you everything you need to know about what's going on in their life. Because they connect with music the same way that we do. And I find with kids, we often forget that they have that ability to connect to music the same way that adults do. So different types of ways that we can use music with children in 
any capacity, whether you're in a hospice, whether you're in a hospital, whether you're with your own children or your cousins or your nieces and nephews, we can use environmental sound to our advantage. So we can make a space welcoming and inclusive with just the sounds that are going on. So a hospice, for example. Pediatric hospices very rarely will use heart rate monitors. And if they do, they're usually turned down to a very low sound. If you are focused on environmental sound, if you are in a hospice and you already have so much anxiety about what's going on in your life and all you hear is heart rate monitors going off, that's not going to help our anxiety, right? It doesn't give us that home-like environment. But if you're in a hospice room and you hear music or a harpist or somebody who is presenting music that meets the energy, that meets where we are, it creates a safe space. People then feel connected. They feel like they are in the right space. And this is used outside of healthcare. When you walk into a retail store, this is the marketing side of me, the music they choose is selected to make you want to shop there or to fit the theme of what they're going for. This is like a consumer behavior concept and it translates back to healthcare perfectly. That's why if you go into a hospital and you're on the like baby unit or in the NICU, they often have those big ears that say like too loud, you're being too loud. It's because they're cognizant of their environmental sound. And we can do that with music as well. We can play music, include instruments. We can have so many different concepts in a room that will create the kind of space that we want. We can also have community music. So we can also have kids come listen to someone like Duncan who will play the harp beautifully or a guitarist or a singer where they don't have the onus of actually playing and putting that vulnerability forward, but they can connect still. And by listening to music, you are still creating a community. And then we can get them involved. So we can do music programming, hands-on music programming. So this would allow for self-emotional regulation. This will create a space for safe vulnerability, allow them to connect with other kids, even if that's like they're chucking their egg shakers at each other, right? It triggers memories and creates memories for them, as well as it's just fun. Kids love to get their hands on things. They love to be silly. They love to really release themselves. And music is a safe way to do that. So that's really how we can engage kids in a pediatric sense um, or a community sense, whether that's a hospital or if you're like me, who's in private practice, I go into kids' homes. You can bring music to them in a way that's not crazy expensive or difficult to travel with. Um, it doesn't always have to be this big elaborate concept. We can break it down and pick and choose when these types of programs are appropriate. So when I worked in pediatric hospice was when I was doing my music care certifications. And part of that was I was to create a music care program. So I chose very select things that I would incorporate into the hospice um, while during my time there. So the first thing I did was I created the concept that there will always be the use of music in common spaces. <laughs> so I bought speakers, I bought instruments, and I made them accessible in every space of the hospice. So there was a speaker in the showers, there was a speaker in every bedroom, there was speakers in every playroom, in every nursing station. And this was not just for the clients we served. This was also for the staff. We got a Spotify account because CDs are not always the easiest to come by anymore. So Spotify allowed us to create playlists, whether that was the evening nurses could have their own playlist that they listen to. Um, we had specific playlists and we had the music room 217 um, CDs in all of the end of life rooms. Um, and I had accessible instruments in all the main play areas for the kids. So we had about five boxes of instruments. That was egg shakers, um, triangles, little pianos, drums. Um, 
I wanted everywhere you walked <laughs> there to be music accessible. They didn't mean everyone had to use it, but it was there. I figured people can't ignore it if it's right in front of their face, which is so true. I also created a designated music space. So this is where kids would know we were going to participate in community music. Um, I bought a huge drum for kids that I worked with that um, were deaf and blind that created such big vibrations they could feel the bass. There was a beautiful piano there. Again, instruments, a speaker. We also invited more community musicians. So not only was just having music important to me in the hospice, I also wanted beautiful people to come into the hospice. The kids that I was working with didn't get to engage the same way with their community as we do. So I wanted there to be people that talked to them and engaged with them. I encouraged the musicians to ask for requests, to get to know the kids and who they were and engage in a different level than just playing because then they got that engagement and socialization that they were looking for. We also used music to help manage behaviors. So this took a little bit longer, <laughs> but it's kind of what I do now, which is how it, how it evolved. But we started using music in silly ways that would help kids with things they were feeling. So the example I always use is that we had a, um, an older gentleman, he was 16, but cognitively he was probably closer to six. And he hated brushing his teeth. Whenever he was staying there, he would never brush his teeth. And he would cause such a stink. He would wave his hands and he'd get all upset if anyone wanted him to brush his teeth. So what we decided to do was, let's try music. So we created a song, a teeth brushing song that we would sing with him that was silly and crazy. And it, it went like this. George is a big boy, big boy, big boy. George is a big boy. Yes, he is. And then he would clap and he would run and brush his teeth. So luckily to my surprise, it worked. Um, but we started doing that for other kids. So if there were kids that were nervous or afraid or had behaviors that we had trouble managing, we would always try music. And whether that was us singing, whether that was every time they got um, a needle, we play certain music in the background or we would sing songs with them. We started using music in our actual care of these children. We'll get into how I actually did that because it's not as easy as I make it sound, but it's worth the time. <laughs> we used music to create memory and legacies for this these families. So whether this is adult hospice or pediatric hospice, our goals are very similar. We want individuals that are in our care to feel like they are leaving behind something and that they are creating beautiful memories with their families because the people that are still gonna stay here they're going to want that as comfort when their loved one is no longer here. So we would sing songs as a family. We would create music. We would do family drum circles. Um, even with kids who had to stay in their rooms and couldn't come out, we would bring music to them. With having all the speakers around, I always had music playing in every single one of my programs. So whether I was doing art, whether I was doing drama, whether I was building Legos, I always made sure that the speaker was on and that we were listening to something. It really just became the background noise of the hospice. And then we could bring it forward to the forefront when we really wanted it. But if not, it was always there for us to use and to really connect with. The last thing that I did is myself and my coworker were in charge of grief and bereavement support. So not only did we help the children who had palliative illnesses with their feelings and their grief, we helped their siblings. So we would use music to teach siblings and young people with different diagnoses about their bodies. So we would use music to teach about heartbeats and irregular heartbeats. We would use music to teach people about what grief feels like. Um, often we would use drums uh, because we could explain that grief come, comes and goes. So we would have kids bang on the drum and say, okay, we're feeling pretty good today. Maybe our grief's not at the forefront of our life, but uh-oh, here comes our grief. We're feeling sad. We're feeling angry. What happens on our drum? What do we do? And they start banging around. And then you would, their parents would come pick them up and they'd be like, mom, do you know what grief sounds like? 
<laughs> and the mom would be like, yes, that is what grief sounds like. So that created a connection, not only within our program, but for their families at home. Um, we'd also get families be like, Danielle, you have to stop teaching these kids how like medicine works and our bodies work with instruments because my neighbors are getting very upset that there's like constantly drums blaring in my house. But that was the way that they understood it and the way they connected with their world around them. So that's how I did it. I always encourage people who ask me, how did I even start it? To make their program whatever they want it to be. That's the beauty of music care is you can make it adaptable and accessible for everybody. So the first step we always need to do is assess the need, which everybody already does, I'm sure, in this room. But what are the strengths and weaknesses of our environment that we're working with? What are the needs of our clientele? And what are the needs of our organizations at large? Because if we can create a plan that meets those needs, it's way harder for anybody to say no to us. <laughs> if we have a bit of a lack of understanding of what kind of needs there are, it's way easier for people to be like, well, let's wait. Well, there's no money. <laughs> it's usually the answer you get, right? So once we have assessed the needs of what's going on, so for my case, the strength of my environment was that we had the spaces. We, ha we had funding to supply it. I was certified to help create it. And our clients needed a way to express themselves that was not verbal. And our staff needed an outlet for self-care and for their own emotional regulation. And the organization needed to support staff's mental health, family's mental health, and programs for kids. So music care made total sense in my situation. Sorry, you'll hear my dog occasionally. Um, next, you need to develop a plan. So this is for us. This is all happening before we even approach anybody. We're looking at, okay, we've determined these needs. Now, how are we going to meet them? What do we need from higher powers in our organization? The less you need, the better. What type of equipment do we need or do we have? And how do we wanna structure our programs? I implemented like seven different changes, but that was over a couple of years. I didn't just come in hot and be like, we're changing everything. We changed one thing at a time. So the first thing we changed was we got speakers. They're really cheap on Amazon and they were really easy. And we got a Spotify account. And then I waited a couple months and then we did something else. So we slowly built and we climbed the mountain until we hit success. So by spelling that out for yourself, it makes you a lot better at doing the next step, which is presenting a plan to whoever you are presenting to. So if you're the manager, fantastic. You're a higher, you're higher powers. You can go right to the top. If you're someone that was like me, that was a frontline or a volunteer, you need to meet with someone to talk about what your vision is. So the first step is to figure out who do you need to meet with? Who is your next direct contact? What is the key information you want to share? So usually I suggest you share the power of music. Why are you fighting so hard to have music? And how's it going to meet the needs? Those are kind of the two big things. And then the next thing people want to know is how much is it going to cost me? So I always say to people for my programs, we started really cheap, like really cheap, like egg shakers, dollar store triangles. Like it didn't need to be anything fancy because I can't really play an instrument. I can play a ukulele thanks to room 217, but that's about it. And I wouldn't even say I'm very good. <laughs> I would say I get by, but that's why I have community musicians and often they're volunteers. So that's fantastic. So and the last piece is, how are you going to sell your program? And this is really, how are you going to sell the impact it's going to have? So the changes that the environment are going to see. And then once we get that green check mark of, yeah, let's see how it goes, we then get to implement it. So setting up your program, is that putting speakers around? Is that determining where music space is going to be? Always ensure that you, you have a plan set up. So always ensure that you know exactly where you're going to start your program. And even if that's just you want to bring in more musicians or maybe right now you're only 
able to have one space and maybe you want to be able to go room to room and see kids or adults in a one-to-one capacity. Just make sure that you have a plan of how you're going to go about it. You also need to make sure that you evaluate your program. So once you've implemented it, are you meeting your needs? Are you seeing the positive feedback from people that you're working with? The last step is ensure that you have staff buy-in, which is our tricky one. But that's why we're all here, because we're music advocates. So with, with anything that's worth it in life, we need to advocate for it. So what I did was, once I got the buy-in and was able to put the speakers everywhere, I actually asked to present at a staff meeting. So I presented Cole's notes of everything that I learned about music care. And then I told everybody what my plan was. So everybody knew. I also put up a map of the four where all the speakers were located and where all the instruments were located. So no one ever needed to say, we didn't use music because we didn't know where the speakers were. You have a handy dandy map. So I ensured that people understood the point of it. And I made sure that they realized that it's not a lot of work. People shy away from things that are adding work onto their plate. It's actually benefiting them and their clients with minimal work. Um, bathing kids became so much easier when kids got to choose a Spotify playlist to play with. Or they could bring an instrument into the bathtub because it was waterproof and plastic and I could disinfect it after. So just making sure that you are communicating always because where I've seen music and not even just music, any program not succeed is when there's no communication and you're the only person advocating. You got to make sure that you have other people that are using strategies. So now I just wanted to look at hospice in general. So pediatrics as a whole is very broad. You can have a million different types of kids, but the formula for using music is similar. We know that we want to play with them. We know that we could be silly. We know they like instruments and hands-on. But hospice can be trickier because you're working with people in a very vulnerable and fragile state in their life. So music care kind of takes on a different feel. And the interesting thing is pediatric hospice is very different than adult hospice, which a lot of people don't realize. So just so that you understand kind of the difference, adult hospice, you go to if you have three months or less to live. So it's very imminent. In pediatric hospice, you get referred to hospice on diagnosis, which means that we could have kids that are babies that live all the way to 18 and they come and go from the hospice. So they get almost like a a hospice respite. They can come for a week. Doctors will watch their symptoms and then they go home. So they come in and out, whereas adults go in, stay in and die there. So it's a very different concept. So when we have adults that are coming in with three months or less to live, it might not be as happy and outgoing and silly as a pediatric hospice may be. So now we're looking for music to bring comfort to people, to still create connection and community, but to create memories and to trigger beautiful memories. Music also for people makes them feel safe. They're in an environment they might not know, going through different things that they don't feel safe going through, but their body has to. And they have a lot of emotions. And whether that's the family, whether that's grandchildren, that's children, that's parents, if you're getting kids that come through adult hospice, which does happen, it's a very different concept. So the way we use music, it's going to be a little bit different. So how adult hospice often will come to me to use music is a lot of it is in end of life care. A lot of it is comforting music. They do often bring in community musicians to play for people at the bedside, to play for family members, um, to play family members' favorite songs. Um, it might be in a religious capacity, um, depending on, or spirituality capacity, depending on what people believe in for end of life. So the music changes, the concept changes, but the principles stay the same. 
that in either environment, whether it's a happy community pediatric program or a more difficult hospice program, we're looking to create connection through music, but also to have it accessible. And this might also look the same as having speakers everywhere, having even CDs available, having that a part of the environment. So when someone is admitted to hospice, they're, they're shown the speakers. Maybe there's a music therapist that comes by or a community musician. The family knows that is a service that we offer. And really just, again, ensuring that we are using music as standard practice. And that comes again down to buy-in. So that's having a list of community musicians for the nurses to call if someone's interested, if someone's not there every day. That's having instruments if people are really into instruments or having a music therapist if that is something that the organization is interested in. Or it could be as basic as having music as an option. And in hospice, music is huge in environmental sound. So I know that if I were dying and going through a palliative experience, I wouldn't want beepers going off, nurses talking about other clients, or PSW who's talking about other clients, families crying, cooks cooking in the kitchen. Like there's so many things that are happening on the daily in a hospice, in a hospital environment, that if we can just change that environmental sound or make people more aware of the sound they're producing, that's care. That's beautiful care that can change somebody's experience. So with that being said, there's a few takeaways that I want you guys, if you're like, I don't ever want to hear this girl talk again, that's okay. But these are the things that I want you to take away from today. One is music, especially since we're talking in pediatrics, should always be accessible to people. And don't always think of music as instruments. That's the one thing that I, I really took away is as I said, I can't play instruments to save my life, but I can still be a part of music and I can still connect with music. And a lot of people feel that way. Um, I run a music program for adults with traumatic brain injuries. And I literally used to get two people sign up because they all thought they would have to play instruments. The minute they saw the word music, they didn't want to come. Once they realized that it's not just about instruments, now I get 15 because we change what we're doing every week and we evolve. Um, and some of this is games like Guess That Tune, right? Like silly games that incorporate music are still a huge part of care. Music can be created with anything, 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 anything. You can create music with your body. You can create music with your mouth. You can create music with pots and pans. Um, with a spoon on a bedside rail, like anything around. You do not need grand pianos and these big expensive pieces of music. You can do it in small amounts. And, and kids especially love that. If you can make something silly musical, they're all in. I think I actually did a program with like a dog toy that squeaks and oinks. And I gave every single one to a kid and we made our own song with them. And they loved it because it made weird sounds and they were laughing, but that met my need. And that's what I needed. It was really cheap. Um, music can also be used instead of verbal language. So to remember that I always saw this beautiful quote actually that I wanted to get framed above the music room that I created at the hospice, but it said, music is there when words are not. And that is so true. When we get, don't have the words to say things, often we go to music. And the example I always put in is if you've ever been to a funeral, since we're talking about hospice, we'll stay on this train. There's always music that makes you cry. <laughs> I'm sorry. They'll play Sarah McLaughlin. Like there's all this music and it triggers emotion on purpose, right? It's very rare that you walk into a funeral and like the song Happy is playing from a kid's movie. It's usually something that creates emotion in you because it's an emotional state. And that's 
a language. That's people telling you the mood of the environment. And that's the same thing goes for how we communicate. And back to what I said about you'll know exactly what mood I'm in based on the music that I'm listening to. It's very helpful for my husband. <laughs> but it's true because that's how I speak. That's how I connect. When bad things happen, when good things happen, I instantly turn on a spe specific type of music. And people who are in hospice, who have different diagnoses, kids are no different. Children connect with music the same way that adults do. And in all my work, whether that's in grief and death, whether that's in um, ADHD, whether that's in the justice system, children and youth can connect to music in the same capacity. And we always have to remember that. Um, I do lyric analysis, analysis, I guess is the plural, um, with kids. And they understand it. And you know what? If they can't read, I read them the lyrics. And we talk about it and I'll say, okay, that let's pause that song. That song said this, what do you think that means? And kids will explain it to you and they absorb it the same way, or they have a totally different view on the song and give you perspective. So never underestimate a child's ability to connect through music. Um, another great way to connect with kids is through music. Um, I'm sure Duncan's harp is very expensive, but if, a child can touch the strings. If you have something that's not super expensive that a kid can try and play, that creates a common ground. Kids see adults often and they see them instantly as authority figures, which it can shut them down into what they're gonna be willing to do with you. But if you can create a playful connection with them, they're way more likely to either express things to you, to tell you things about their life, especially if you see like siblings, grandchildren of people in a hospital, they might be like, touch your harp and be like, hey, did you know that my grandpa's in room 201? And you'll be like, oh, really? Interesting. Do you come visit him? And then he'll be like, yes. And then sometimes kids will be like, he's here because of blah, 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 blah. And they'll just start talking to you about everything that's going on in their life. And all that just because you invited them to come and touch your instrument or play something with you or choose a song. Music is the most powerful way to create community. It truly is. And I'm not just saying that because I'm here on this webinar. I have yet to find something as powerful as music to create that connection. Um, very little things in my practice can I get everybody in one room doing. But listening to music and engaging in music is one of those things. So we use that to our advantage. And the last thing that I hope you take away from this is we all here know that music is so fantastic. That's why we're all on this webinar. But it always needs to be advocated for. So we always need to ensure that we are going to organizations, we are going to people and saying like, this is why we use music. I used to go to my boss and be like, look at this room. Like this right here is why we do what we do. And it might not have taken us a lot of money or a lot of time, but that doesn't matter. It's, this is exactly the connection that we need. And this is where we need to have people be to create this fantastic environment. And often we, we all work in environments that are not always the easiest to be in. Long-term care, hospitals, hospices. They're difficult places to be. But if we can make those places a little bit brighter and a little bit happier, then we are doing our job and we are advocating for things that are important as a holistic intervention for people. We're treating people as people and not just as diagnoses and illnesses. So that being said, I did leave some time. So we have about 12 minutes. Um, for is there any experiences that you guys have had that you wanna share um, or things that maybe you work in a facility and you really want to bring music there, but you're kind of tricked, stuck on how to do that? or you're making the transition from seniors to kids and you feel unsure about how to go about doing that and how to incorporate music with seniors to music with kids. Um, feel free to unmute yourself to write in the chat if there's anything that you wanna discuss, um, as well as my next slide is just questions. So if you have questions at this time, feel free to ask me. I'm an open book and happy to uh, answer any questions or comments that you guys have.
I would love to hear from Duncan um, to little to to learn maybe a little bit more about what he does as well with that beautiful harp that's sitting behind him. Thank you. My main work is at this point with the staff in most cases. Um, once we've had COVID, I'm not going into the rooms as much um, in hospice, although I occasionally will still do that. But the sound goes into the rooms from the hallway. And I draw on music all the way from Gregorian chant, all the way up to current pop stuff and, you know, hymns, shaker music, you know, Renaissance, Baroque, dance. I mean, there's everything. And I have as many songs as I possibly can and tunes because I want to be able to have as much access to the different kinds of culture and spirituality. And I'm thinking in this discussion, which has been valuable, thank you so much, Daniel, for doing this, is that for children, the same thing. I mean, as we're watching the world environment right now, the horrors that are going on, there are so many cultures, I mean, so many different cultures, and there are groups working in different war and conflict zones. And they are also doing the same thing, looking at the Pacific cultures. And while our own areas may not have a number of cultures, I think it's really good as we think for children, especially, that we may want to make sure that we do the work and the research to look at what we do to bring, bring that. So the main work I do with the heart, back to the question, not trying to take up too much time here, is primarily comforting and healing music. Um, I have to support the idea that music is the best way to communicate. There are so many times um, that it's the only thing that will connect with somebody, and um, especially at all levels. So. I know we're short on time. Um, thank you for allowing me to talk, but I want to make sure that people have a chance to talk as well. Thank you so much, Duncan. Um, yeah, it's it. You hear the same kind of theme coming up: is that music is the one thing that that can connect everybody, and you know, music is the one thing. Definitely, I know. Looking back on on my years, there's always a song that reminds me of a day. You know, it's not the day that reminds me of the song. It's a song that reminds me of the day, whether it's the first dance at your wedding or a song that was at a funeral or a song that was, but it's always the song that comes first. And then you remember that day or you'll remember that feeling or you'll, there's, it's just has so many connections. Um, and I'm just, I'm going over um, so much that you said, uh, Danielle, it was, it's, it's unbelievable. And um you know, even the uh, assess, develop, present, and implement. You know, that's one of the things, obviously, in our training, um, we have our initiatives and things like that, and our certified programs are all about initiatives. And, and you know, sometimes it's, it's, it's a simple implement. It's bringing in shakers. It's, you know, it's allowing these kids or, 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 you know, humming is, is music. It doesn't have to be, like you said, it doesn't have to be a, a guitar or a harp. Um, you know, it can just be you s sitting there humming with somebody and, and making them feel a little bit better that day. And that's the beauty of music and care. It doesn't have to be a lot. You don't have to be a musician, like you said. You know, although I'm, I'm sure me singing comparatively to a Duncan playing his harp, you know, people may say, you know, Tanya, I think we'd rather have the musician. Uh, but if if Duncan's not around, you know, it doesn't matter. People people will accept what you got as long as it's there to make them feel a little bit better so i don't know if anybody else has any questions um that they'd like to ask danielle today i know there was i think uh kara i think uh you were transitioning am i is was it kara or melinda i think melinda was tr is transitioning to kids in the last three years so i didn't know if she wanted to ask any questions now's the perfect time um or Peggy, I know you're there. Um, if anybody has any questions for Danielle. I uh, Yeah, I thought the presentation was great. And as, as you went along, I kept thinking back to your um, almost opening statement about 
uh, music and playfulness. And I think um, you really presented well the throughout the presentation, how there's very few things in life, but with music, it allows people to be playful. It gives it gives permission to express emotions and have fun. And in society, I think we're overall, maybe post-COVID too, and not just, you know, in COVID, but post-COVID, so limited um, in um, that dynamic. So I really appreciate that. Thank you so much. So I don't really think it's a question. Um, I've seen me, I've seen music with, uh, I worked with seniors, but we'd have occasionally, uh, kids from across the, um, road come in and, uh, sing for us on special occasions, just fabulous for the kids and fabulous for the, uh, seniors. Thank you very much. Yeah, no problem. Thank you for those compliments. I appreciate that. And something that I didn't say too, um, that's great for intergenerational programming too. If you think about just my brain goes wild when I present too, because I learned so much from you guys as well, but long-term care has like seniors who have kids who might also have grandkids. And it's something that creates connection between the generations. And if a kid goes to listen to a community musician and her, their parent gets to go, we often forget the impact of that. We often forget that people don't often just get to go and be that parent or be that grandparent or be that child. There's always a caregiving piece to it. And when we do programs like this, we eliminate that caregiver piece sometimes and they get to actually just be moms and dads or kids or siblings. Um, which is a beautiful experience in general as well. Like they get to just sit there and enjoy. So I appreciate that. And I appreciate learning more about you, Duncan. That's so amazing. And your harp is just so beautiful in the background. I'm glad Tanya said some things. <laughs> so I like, want to come to Ottawa and play your harp for me. Um, Melinda had asked me on a non-music care side of how I transitioned from long-term care to pediatrics in the chat. So just quickly, um, a little skill is that, well, a little note is, skills are all transferable. And that's something that you need to really present to people, um, especially in a world of healthcare is that how I program with seniors, I have the skills to program with kids too. Um, it's always good to have experience. Uh, if you don't have never worked in pediatrics, try and pick up a couple volunteer shifts. Or if you're a musician or you have a specific skill, offer that to a pediatric organization um, on a volunteer basis and get something on your resume that shows that you have some sort of experience with kids. And then I suggest that you just put yourself out there, put your resumes out there. Um, if you get those interviews, really focus on the fact that you are transferable and your skills are transferable and that things like music and recreation are accessible for everybody. Uh, how I did it was that's literally how I did it. <laughs> I had experience from when I was younger, like in high school days of working with the Special Olympics and different places. And then I literally just put my resumes out there and the hospice saw my resume. And one of the first questions they asked me was that you don't have tons of experience with kids, but you have lots with seniors. Like, do you think those skills are transferable? And I had said, yes, they are. Everything that I do is completely transferable. Um, because all of these beautiful modalities that we use, like music, art, all those kind of things, and how you facilitate them are transferable. It is irrelevant who's sitting in front of you. Yeah, you might change the song selection or how you use the, the instrument, but it doesn't really matter. Um, I also work with caregivers now who have um, wives, daughters with palliative illness, and I provide support groups all through recreation, play music, um, that's something I never did before, but I did secretly without even knowing. So just always remember that you have skills that are transferable and you can transition into any calling that you have. I hope that helps Melinda. I went on a little bit of a excited rant. but <laughs> Well, if that's all for today, thank you so much, uh, Danielle, for, for sharing with us, um, you know, your, your, what you do right now, uh, your thoughts and, and, and how to 
really develop and, and like we said, develop and implement programs within hospices and in pediatrics. Um, you know, things like this really go a long way. And, and it always, it's always nice for people to learn and to have something to, to start with and, and a basis and, and just the, the few tips that you were able to give them is definitely a, a good start. Um, Danielle's email is there if you, as well as her website, if you have any more questions, please feel free to email her. If you do want a certificate for uh, being here today, please email me at tlbus at room 217. And thank you so much, everybody. And go out and enjoy this day. It's uh, actually springtime. Thank, Thank you. you so much, everyone. I appreciate it and have a fantastic rest of your week. Don't hesitate if you want to chat with me to email me. Thanks, Danielle. Bye. Bye. Thank you, Danielle.